I'll start out by creating a sketch and you could create a sketch by tracing or by using the grid transfer method, or you could just freehand sketch it. Either way, you're gonna have basically the same sketch. Sketch is important because it's going to be the foundation or the blueprint for where everything is in your portrait. So it's good to get that looking pretty decent before you start, but it's only a small portion of what it takes to make a painting, so don't worry about tracing. If you wanna go ahead and trace to get your sketch, go ahead and do that. Next, I'm gonna go ahead and fill in some of the darkest areas on a new layer. I called that layer dark, and this is just going to be the absolute darkest of the dark areas. The brush that I'm using is the Smooth Palette Knife. The reason why I like this brush is because it gives you a nice smooth painterly effect, but it also blends a little bit while you're putting down paint. And so that's really helpful when you're trying to save time by mixing two values together to get an intermediate value. For example, if I mixed black and white together, I would get gray. If I mixed light gray and white together, I'd get a lighter gray. So I'm gonna put in a few little areas here and there, small areas, big areas. I wanna avoid drawing too many lines here. There are gonna be a few lines in this piece, but I don't wanna, for example, draw a line surrounding the ear and so on. I only wanna use lines where they actually appear in the piece. Next, I'm gonna create another layer and I'm gonna go ahead and fill that with kind of a darker medium gray for the background. I'll just go right along all the edges here just to fill that in. Next, I'm gonna create a new layer and I'll use this for a light gray that I'll use for all of the skin color here. I'll just go ahead and fill that layer with that. And since the background layer is on top of that, it just fills in that uncovered area there in the center. I'm gonna create another layer called medium dark gray. I'll put that above that background layer and I'll just fill in the suit area and anything else that's that medium darker gray color. Now I'm keeping these values on separate layers for a few different reasons. One is if I make a mistake, I can always go back and correct that very easily. For example, I could change that value lighter or darker without having to repaint it. I can also leverage the layer order. So rather than painting over an edge to fix it again, I can simply paint behind a layer that's covering it up and that edge is maintained. And it helps to get me thinking about certain regions like dark areas and medium areas and light areas. And it helps me just to mentally break down the piece to make it more digestible. So what I'm trying to do here is add form, and I add form by creating contrast between light and dark colors. So I want to add as many different values as I can. I'm looking at my reference photo and I'm hunting for certain areas. Right now I'm hunting for kind of the, all the dark grays that I see in the reference image. I'm going to put all those in. Anywhere where there's a similar value, I want to add that in. Then I'll move on to lighter areas and darker areas. And that's how I'm going to build up the form of my piece and help it look three-dimensional is by establishing all of these areas. Right now I'm just blocking them in kind of loosely, and if you wanted to do your painting in this kind of style, you could certainly leave it this way, but eventually I will go through and blend and soften. You can use the nine step value scale that I have here, which is basically just white to black and then some shades in between, and that'll help you get most of your values blocked in. You can always go in between and add intermediate values if you want. But you can see here again, I'm keeping my values on separate layers. I don't have to have a layer for every different value, but I'll just kind of use layers here and there as however I feel like using them. Sometimes just kind of spontaneous, however I feel like painting. Right now I'm painting a light gray on the medium dark gray layer. So, you know, the layer names aren't super accurate at this point, but I know what they are because I can easily hide and show the layer to see what's on that layer. Eventually I'm going to merge all my layers down and it won't really be an issue to have the wrong layer names. So you see I'm going lighter and lighter with these grays, and each time I go lighter and lighter, as long as I'm following the shape or the contour of the object that I'm painting, it's going to start to look more three-dimensional. And so on the face, the face is kind of a combination of spherical shapes. And so as I'm painting this in, I'm keeping that in mind. I'm hunting around my image, my reference image, and I'm looking for different shapes. Each shadow has a different shape. Each highlight has a different shape. The overall mid-tones on the face have a shape, and so you want to visually hunt for each of those areas. The area that you're painting on your canvas should be the exact area that you're looking at on your reference image, and you want to focus in on a very small, very tiny box while you're painting. Don't look at the overall piece unless that's your goal, is to work on the piece as a whole. Focus in like you're using a magnifying glass. For example, here I'm just adding little highlights, and the highlights you want to use sparingly. They give life to the piece, so make sure you have a few highlights and a few very dark areas and a lot of gray values in between. 
Raised areas that are pointed towards the light will be the brightest, and areas that are blocked by the light will be in shadow and be the darkest. I've gone ahead and saved a copy of my work, and I'm going to flatten all the layers except for the canvas layer, which is the background and the sketch. So all of those different value paint layers are now merged together. Now I'm going to use the smooth palette knife to go in and add some intermediate tones. So for example, I added a in-between gray between that light gray and the dark gray. And I'm just going to look at my reference photo again and look for these different intermediate tones and put them in. You can create more transitions also by blending. I'm going to use the coarse oily blender here to blend a little bit. You want to follow the contours of the face. You don't want to paint in the wrong direction here because it'll make the face look flat. So follow the contour of the cheek and the nose, etc. I'm going to go ahead and merge all of my layers down except for the canvas. That's combining my sketch with my grayscale painting here. I'm going to zoom in close and I'm going to use the smooth palette knife just to put in some of the very, very small fine details around the eyes and the glasses here. Usually I don't work this close on a painting, but because these are very thin, very fine areas, I do need to get in nice and close here to be able to put this in. So I'm just going through and adding just the basic values that I see in my reference image. I have my reference image open on a secondary monitor off to the right. You can't see it, but I'm using that to zoom in and out to certain areas so that I can focus on particular parts of the face. At this point, I've put down a lot of different values and mixed some of them together. So really, I should be able to sample all the colors I need from my canvas now using Alt. So if I need a particular dark gray, I'll select that directly from the canvas. I'm just going to clean up the edges a bit here with that background color just to tighten it up and make it a lot less sloppy. And I'll correct any shapes wherever I need to correct them. For example, on the lenses here, whatever's behind the lenses is going to get distorted by the lens. And so you're going to see the face kind of cut in a little bit towards the face like you wouldn't expect it to. Now you might be wondering, why am I painting this so sloppy? Or you might be saying, what do you mean by sloppy? It looks really good. In either case, what I'm doing here is I'm just roughing this in. This is the rough stage. I'm not going to worry about wrinkles and freckles and eyelashes. I just want the overall gist of the light and dark values in the piece and the overall structure of the piece. I'll go in later and I'll blend and I'll finesse it and add texture and all that stuff. But I want to make sure that overall it's kind of a, a foundation that I've set down first. You'll see me zoom out periodically. And I'm zooming out because when I look at it small, it helps me get an overall view of how the piece is coming together. And if it looks good small, you know you're on the right track. Generally, things are going to look better small no matter what. And when you zoom in, they're probably going to look worse because you're going to see more of the flaws. So you have to find that balance between zoomed in and zoomed out. You should be working on the piece at the same distance that someone would be looking at the piece. And so if you're not going to be looking at it up close, right up next to it, then feel free to zoom out a bit while you're working because that'll give you a better idea of how it's going to look to people who are enjoying this piece. So now I'm using the airbrush to go over this piece and I'm softening some areas and adding some big soft shadows. You want to hunt in your reference image for these big soft areas. They have their own shapes and they're different from the sharper, more noticeable areas that kind of pop out like highlights. So these are typically shadows or glowing lights across the face. So you want to look at individual areas of the face, but you want to think of the face and the head as being its own 3D object as well. I'm going to save a copy of my artwork, and I'm going to merge my paint layers down into a single layer. Looking at it from far away, it looks a little too soft and fluffy, so I need some sharpness added in here. So I'm going to zoom in kind of close, and I'm going to add in some fine little sharp areas. I'll do this around the eyes to give some life to the eyes. Now I have a habit of painting things as I imagine them rather than how they actually look in the reference image. And so you'll notice that as I'm working on this, I keep going back to the eyes. The eyes are very important to get looking correctly because they're generally the focal point of a portrait. People are drawn to looking at the eyes. If the eyes don't look good, then the rest of the painting is going to suffer as well. Now this is a particularly difficult eye position because he's kind of squinting and looking off to the side. And so I'm incorrectly drawing the eyes as I imagine them. So they're going to look a little weird until towards the end when I actually have the patience to sit there and focus on just the eyes. It's easy to get overwhelmed by the entire painting. And so that's kind of what's happening here is I'm trying to get a little bit of everything done so that it's all pretty equal. And then I'll go back to certain areas like the outfit and the face and the teeth and the glasses. And I'll give them their own TLC to help them look a little better. Now I'm going in and I'm blending and softening some areas using the diffuse blur blender. 
and that helps me kind of mix some of these areas together and transition them. You don't want to destroy all of your sharp areas, but you want to make some nice smooth transitions wherever they appear in your reference image. Now there's a couple different ways to use this brush. If you press down lightly and you blend, you're just going to lightly soften an area. If you press down really firmly, you're going to blend it together and really mix it up. And so I'm using a balance between those two different techniques here just to clean this up. I'm blending over my sketch lines a little bit just to make those go away. I'll keep them anywhere where they're necessary, but for the most part, they just need to kind of blend in and be very subtle from this point on. I don't really need them as guides anymore because my guides have more or less been replaced by all of the different value structure that I added here. Now it's important to not over blend. If you do over blend, it's okay. You can add back in sharpness like I'm going to do here because you want there to be a balance between sharp and smooth and soft and hard. And so it is going to be a back and forth process. You're going to see me blend stuff that I'm going to sharpen and I'm going to blend it again and then I'm going to sharpen it. And it's going to really seem like I'm undoing and redoing a bunch of work, but that layering and that building up of techniques is what ends up giving you that realistic appearance. You, you have to put in the time into a portrait in order for it to look realistic. And so that's what I'm doing here. Now, if you paint something in too light or too dark, you can always airbrush over it to knock it back. You can see that I did that on the wrinkle in the eye and the whites of the eyes. I'm helping to tone those down. You could do that on the same layer, or you could do that on separate layers if you wanted to minimize the risk of having to repaint something. You can see I'm really struggling with the eyes here because I want them to look the way that I imagine them, and I'm not paying attention to my reference photo closely enough to see how they actually should look. And then again, I end up bouncing around somewhere else, like to the teeth. Now, that could be me. Maybe I don't have the ability to really focus on one area. Maybe my mind jumps around more than the average person. I don't know but I do jump around a lot on my artwork. And I feel like that's important because if you see something that stands out, you don't want to forget about it. You want to go over and fix it, and then that can be something that's not nagging you anymore, and then you can focus on another detail. And so for me, that's the reason why I jump around a lot. I try to be pretty linear about my process, but you know, if I get bored of working on one area, why not go over and work on another area like the ear? Right here, I'm using the pinch brush, and that helps me sharpen some edges by painting over them to sharpen them and pinch them together. You have to be careful of over pinching. I over pinched the cheek there. And so I have to go in and paint that back in and clean that up. So at this point, it's kind of starting to look semi-realistic. And a lot of people would stop and they'd go, OK, that looks good enough. There's my portrait. But that's really what makes the difference between a good portrait that people are going to recognize and see as being photorealistic versus something that looks unfinished you have to put a lot of time into your portrait. And so if you're thinking at this point it looks good enough, well, you're wrong. We're gonna go on much, much longer. We're maybe a quarter or maybe a third of the way through this painting. Overall, this took me about five hours to paint and I paint pretty fast, so just keep that in mind. If you're doing a portrait and it's taking you 10 or 20 hours to do, that's probably a reasonable amount of time if you don't do a lot of portraits. Again, I'm pinching the edges here just to clean up those shapes. That's easier than repainting them. Sharpens them, and if I end up making them too sharp, I can always blend them again to soften them. Put in a few little fine little creases and lines with a tiny brush here. When you're painting older people, you can't have their skin be too soft because that's just not how it is in real life. So he needs to have a lot of texture and wrinkles and details on his face for this to be obvious that he's an older gentleman. I'm going to go ahead and save a copy of my work, create a new layer, set it to multiply, and then I'll use the airbrush just to paint over some big, broad shadow areas to help this look more three-dimensional. There's an overall shadow on the left side of his head because the light is coming mostly from the top right. So again, as a whole, the head and the body are their own single three-dimensional shape. And if you start to get closer to the ears and the nose, those are also three-dimensional shapes that are a little more complex. So you have to jump around between overall global details and then more localized specific details. Here I'm cleaning up the neck a little bit. I'm doing this from a distance because it does help me get a better idea of the impact I'm having on the piece. If I'm looking at it too close, it's not really representational of what it's going to look like at the distance that I want people to enjoy it at. So I've been working from broad to fine. You'll notice that I blocked in all of the big large areas first. Now I can go into each of these objects like the ear and I can start working on them as their own object and give them enough detail. I'm just blocking in each of these values pretty roughly because I know I'm going to go through and blend them with diffuse blur just to soften some areas. That helps the ear look a lot more natural. 
I'm going to flip my canvas horizontally. Flipping the canvas horizontally gives you a fresh view of your piece and it helps you more easily see mistakes. You can also flip your reference image if that helps. Gone ahead and flipped it back. And I'm doing more work on the eyes because I keep looking at the piece and I keep getting drawn to the eyes and going, something doesn't look right. And you'll see I keep going back to it again and again and again until finally I get it looking the way I want. And that's how you have to do it when you're painting anything, whether it's a portrait or anything else that you're painting from a reference. It takes that time to observe and see what you did wrong. And sometimes that takes an hour or two hours or three hours or ten hours. You can't be expected to absorb all the details of a face unless you have a photographic memory, which most of us don't. I've gone ahead and pulled my reference image into the reference image palette so that I can see it side by side. When your reference image is right next to your canvas, it helps you really easily compare the two better than you can if your reference image is off on another screen or separate. So now I can really focus in on a few particular tight areas like the wrinkles next to the eye or the corner of the eye or the lenses on his glasses. And I'm just focusing on one small area in the painting and looking over at that same one small area on the face in the reference image. And I do this in multiple passes over and over and over again. And each time I do a pass, I focus on smaller, more specific details. So I'm using a digital airbrush here because that gives me a softer edge. So if I want anything to be nice and soft, but still kind of almost a sharp line like that hair, for instance, I'll use the digital airbrush for that. I'm also going to use that just here and there to put in some little creases on the chin and little wrinkles and things like that. It's all these little details that combine to help this look like the person that it's supposed to be representing. Now I'm using the airbrush when I want there to be kind of a subtle transition in two tones or if I want there to look like there's a, a kind of soft dent or a little bit of tinting or coloring and things like that. Whereas I'm using a sharper brush, like for example, the smooth palette knife, if I want there to be a nice sharp area like an edge or hair and things like that. So you really do have to be able to see the difference between sharp and smooth in your reference image and find brushes that can translate that into your painting. Some brushes work better because they're sharper, some work better because they're smoother, and some brushes are versatile enough to do both depending on the kind of pressure that you use or the size of the brush. Here I'm putting in just a few little hairs here and there on the neck. I'm not going to do all the hair at this point, but I do want to do just a few just to kind of cover the edges around the ear and the back of the neck. I'm using this smooth palette knife for that. It works really well for hair. Then I'm going to jump around a little bit more back to the eyes. My goal here for this piece is not for this to look 100% like the reference image. I want it to be maybe 90% like the reference image because I want it to look like a painting and I want it to look like something that's unique that I created rather than just being a replica of the photo. It's also important to mention that Portraits don't have to be this detailed. They don't have to be super detailed. You can do a very simple portrait. As I mentioned earlier, I could have kept that palette knife effect that I had earlier without doing any of this blending or transitioning and stuff. And people might have been able to look at that and tell who it was. So it's up to you to decide what style you want to do your portrait in. In this particular example, I wanted to go for something that was photorealistic, but still had a little bit of the impression of being a portrait painting. And so that's the particular effect I wanted for this, but not the effect that I use for all of my portraits. Now I'm going to blend a little bit with the coarse oily blender. Blenders are useful not only to blend values together, but you can also sharpen areas in your piece. You can add texture and you can add contour to the objects in your piece. Next, I'll select a diffuse blur and I'll go ahead and soften a bit using a light pressure just to take back some of that soft area. Again, you want there to be a blend between sharp and smooth and you have to be able to identify this in your reference image. As I mentioned earlier, you're hunting for shapes, but you also want to hunt for the softness of the shape. Is it a soft shape or a hard shape? I feel like I can improve the shape of the eye a little bit, so I'm going to try to paint that and sculpt it and get it looking a little more correct. I still feel like the eyes are a little bit too dark in value because they're being covered up by the lenses from the glasses. They do need to be a little bit lighter. Just imagine that reflection being right on top of the eye, it's going to make it a little bit lighter because the dark part of the eye is going to blend with the light part of the lenses. Now getting the skin texture to look correct is a little bit tricky because you need smooth areas and you need harsh areas. And so you do need to have a little bit of texture on the face. For somebody that's this age, you're going to have a lot more texture than someone like a baby, for instance, who might have smoother skin texture. I've gone ahead and flattened all my layers and created a duplicate. 
Then I'm blending using a brush that I created called Drip Pores, and that creates little pore shapes. I've gone ahead and reduced the opacity of that layer, and then I'm blending those pores a little bit with the diffuse blur to blend them in. The reason why I duplicated the layer is because then I can blend on it, and I don't have to risk messing up my original. Now I'm pinching and re-sculpting the ear just to get that looking a little more correct. And just hopping around here and there, wherever I see little details that I want to throw in, that's where I'm going to throw them in. Little wrinkles around the eyes, and just focusing on very, very small, fine areas rather than the bigger picture overall. Over here by the nose, there's some subtle value changes that I want to take care of. There's a little bit of texture that I want to add in. And so you're looking for these very, very subtle changes in value and texture. You have to really look really hard to see them, but if you spend enough time on a piece, you really start to notice a lot of these details that you wouldn't otherwise notice if you really rushed through this piece. So feel free to take your time on portraits. It's really important. Now there is kind of a priority to how I'm painting this here. I'm putting the most emphasis on the eyes because those are the most important. And then there's a lot of other features like the nose and the mouth and the ears that are important. But you might notice that I haven't really done much to the hair. And that's because I really want to put most of my time and effort into the face. That's the most important part here. And if I don't get the hair exactly perfect, people probably aren't going to notice as much as if I don't get the face perfect. So I will come to the hair in a little bit, but I want to dedicate just a huge section of my time to the face first, and then I'll tackle the hair. And I'm putting in some little wrinkles and age spots and all of these things help put into context how old this person is here. So I've softened a little bit using the diffuse blur and now I'm pinching using the pinch brush again. That's adding back in sharpness. And as I mentioned earlier, it's a back and forth process of sharpening and softening. That way you get that nice mix. It's kind of all mixed together, swirled together. There's some areas that are completely sharp, areas that are completely soft, and then everything in between. So the shirt isn't quite as important as the hair and the face. I would put that as the last priority, but it still needs to be as detailed as the hair and the face. So it still needs to look semi-photorealistic. It doesn't need to be super detailed because it will be kind of out of focus and the focus will be drawn onto the face with a blur later on. So you can get away with kind of half painting in certain details if they are going to be blurred out in the end. And that's going to be the case with the shirt and part of the hair. And you can see that represented in the reference photo. If you look at the back of the hair where it touches the neck, that edge is more out of focus than some of the edges near the sideburns, for example. So in photographs and in real life, edges that are moving away from you in three-dimensional space generally get blurrier because of focal effects. Now I'm going to basically paint this shirt just like I painted the face. I'm focusing on sharp and smooth. I'm looking for different values and I'm just breaking it down into each of the values. I'm hunting around the same way in the reference image, looking at the shirt and the suit as I was looking at the face. So now I'm going to jump back over to the eyes again and still I need to put a little bit more work into those to get them to match. You'll notice overall I've spent the most time on the eyes. I've come back to it time and time again and that's because when people look at this painting they're going to be looking at the eyes first. Back to the suit again and I'm using the digital airbrush here. I'm using a bigger brush to get kind of more shallow wrinkles and then I can use a smaller brush to get deeper wrinkles. If I use a dark color of course it's going to look like a dent. If I use a light color, it's going to look like it's pushed out towards the light. I do want to use little fine brushes here and there and put little edges on the collar and so on. Now I'm going to go ahead and zoom in to just the face on the reference image so that I can focus just on one area and I can see the details a little bit closer. And that's going to help me really just focus in on particular areas rather than being overwhelmed by the whole thing. I am still going to jump around a little bit, but I won't be jumping around to the hair or to the suit because I won't be able to see the suit in the reference image. So in a way it kind of forces me to focus by doing it this way. You could do this on your canvas as well by putting some sort of stencil over it where you can only see a small area of it while you're painting. I'm going to do a little bit of work on the teeth. I added some bright white highlights to give life to them. And I also want to make sure that I don't make the teeth all completely white or that'll look fake. Teeth are actually kind of a bone color. So you want to make sure you avoid painting things pure white or pure black unless they actually are pure white or pure black. And things that are pure white are usually bright highlights, like I'm putting on the nose, and I'm putting on the glasses. Those are the light reflecting right into your eye, and you can't get any whiter than that. So make sure that things like the teeth and the hair aren't quite as white, otherwise you won't be able to see those highlights on top of them. And same goes for the dark colors too. Don't make things like the suit completely dark black, because if you wanted to put a shadow from the head on the suit, you wouldn't be able to see that shadow. 
Now it's time to add in a little bit more hair. I'm gonna go ahead and do that on a new layer because then I don't have to worry about accidentally painting over the parts of the face that I'm happy with. If I'm not happy with the hair, I can always erase it or modify it without having to erase the skin and things that I painted underneath. I'm using the smooth palette knife here, this works really well because it's kind of a semi-transparent brush. Areas of it are transparent and areas of it are opaque. So it gives you that nice hair effect. It works especially well for portraits if you want kind of a more painterly look. Now what I'm doing is I'm cleaning up the background here because I went a little over the top with the hair. I painted in more of it than there should have been. I'm gonna use a very small, very fine brush to draw on some very fine hairs. You want there to be a mix of hair clumps and individual little free-floating fine hairs that are kind of doing their own thing. It really depends on the hairstyle. I'm gonna turn on Preserve Transparency and I'm gonna tone that down, make it a little bit darker, because as I mentioned earlier, you don't wanna make the hair too white. I have a habit of painting things too white, but you can see now that I toned it down and made it darker, now I can add some highlights on top of that that you can see. I'll add a little bit of shine on the head as well, use an airbrush to help that kind of glow. Now because you have to draw a lot of hairs, you can end up getting cramps in your hands, so feel free to take a break if you need to, save your artwork and come back to it and then draw some more hair. You definitely don't want to rush through the hair, but you also don't want to cripple your hand. But this is really the best way to draw hair. You have to really draw each hair individually and make sure it's going in the right direction and it's the right length and the right color. You can't just get a hairbrush that just spits out hair and expect it to look realistic. If I made it too dark, I'll go ahead and paint over it with the airbrush to soften it a little bit. And I'm just drawing in shadows here on the hair. That way it looks like hairs are overlapping other hairs and it really helps it look realistic. Again, I'm just hunting around in my reference image the same way that I was doing for the face and the suit, and that will help me determine where to put these different values for the hair. Now on the average human head, there's anywhere between tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of individual hair follicles. So you can just imagine how many brush strokes I've drawn here. I probably have drawn at least hundreds, if not thousands of individual hairs. So I think I'm pretty happy with how the hair is looking. I've gone ahead and merged some of those hair layers. I'm just going to clean it up a bit more by drawing in a few more little fine hairs here and there. Next I'm going to add some fine details to the suit and that'll help it look more realistic. Just some little creases and lines and textures and things like that. I just want to make sure that it's matching my reference image pretty accurately. And at this stage it's a lot less about blocking things in and drawing details. Those things are already pretty well drawn in. I already know what shape the ears are going to be and where I want them. I just want to make sure that they're absolutely as close to the reference image as possible. So if there's a shadow that's out of place or there's a shape that's out of place, I need to tweak that. But I'm not making major changes here to this. I'm making very small minor changes. And you might think, why even bother? You know, how many times have I come back to the eyes just to make a tiny little bump or something like that on the eye? But that tiny little bump makes a difference. It brings this portrait from being, let's say, 80% accurate to maybe more like 90% accurate by adding all these little details. But the closer you get to 100%, the more of those little details you have to add. And at a certain point, it's not really worth it to try to get to 100% because then all you're doing is replicating a photo. If I want to sharpen the edges of the suit a bit and add some wrinkles, I can use the pinch brush for that. It works really well. The suit could also benefit from having some fabric texture, so I'll create a new layer and I'll go ahead and paint using the square chalk brush along with a paper texture that looks like a woven fabric. I'll go ahead and reduce the opacity of that layer and just use different composite methods to blend it in. Multiply generally works pretty well. I'll add some texture to the face on a new layer using the sponge and a pretty big sponge. I'll reduce the opacity of that layer to help blend that in and I'll add a second layer of skin texture using that sponge with a lighter color. Then I'll just go ahead and blend it a little bit, soften it, knock it back, and that helps the skin look more textured. I'm going to add some more highlights here on the lenses of the glasses as well to help those stand out. And I tried to apply a layer mask and I got a crash. So what do we do when Corel Painter crashes? What we do is we search our computer for Corel Painter Recovered. We go to our Recovered folder and voila, there's our Recovered Saved Painting. Most of the time it's going to save your artwork, so don't worry if you have a crash. Really, you don't have to worry too much about it if you've been saving as often as I have and if you've been saving iterations. Now I'm adding in some very, very fine hairs here using the Detail Oils brush with a tiny, tiny brush to add in eyebrow hairs and little free-floating hairs. I'm also going to do a little bit more work on the lenses of the glasses because I want those to look nice and reflective and shiny. I'll go ahead and diffuse blur on the background itself to smooth that out so it's a nice, smooth background without any rough textures. 
and I'll just do a few tweaks here and there with smaller brushes to add in a few little wrinkles. I'm just getting finer and finer and finer with all of my details that I'm adding in here. And at this point, I'm going to start finalizing the piece, just adding a few little touches here and there and corrections, but probably not going to add any more major changes. So I'm taking my time with this. I'm taking breaks. I'm coming back to it. And I'm just sitting and I'm looking at it and comparing and spending a lot of time looking for mistakes. I'm not rushing through this. And that's really one of the most important elements of the painting process is to take time to reflect on your artwork. You need to spend time looking at it because if you rush through it and you're painting it, you're not seeing all those details that'll stand out to everyone else. Now I'm going to go ahead and save a copy of my work as a PSD so that I can bring it into Photoshop and do a little bit of editing. I'm going to add a blur gallery iris blur effect. That's going to make the outer edges of the canvas blurry and it'll get sharper as it moves towards the center. It'll give me that nice focal effect and draw the attention towards the center of the piece. I'll save a copy as a PSD and bring it back into Corel Painter. I'm going to use the Blur Blender just to soften some areas such as the hair and anywhere else where it's too sharp. Now, I do want to experiment here with adding color to this piece because as I'm working on this, I wasn't sure if I was going to keep it in black and white or do some glazing to add color. And so really in the end, I don't end up keeping the color, but I thought I would keep the color experiment here in the video just in case you want to add color to your piece. So to add color, you'll create a new layer above your black and white layer, and you can set the composite method to color or multiply. And then you can simply just use something like the airbrush just to tent over it and add different colors. Now, some colors are gonna work better than others. Some colors in the end, you don't want there to be any gray underneath. Like yellow, for example, isn't going to look like a bright yellow if there's a gray underneath. So I'm just adding layers and layers and layers of color. And this is called glazing. And you could use the glazing brushes in Corel Painter 2017. Those will work really well but I created this particular piece in Krill Painter 2016. So here's me experimenting with adding a background color and trying some different effects for the color here and there, just to see how it looks. Sometimes you have to see how it looks to decide if it's helping the piece or hurting the piece. I think that adding color isn't necessarily helping. It does look okay, but I think it looks better in black and white. So I'm gonna remove the color, jump back into Photoshop, maybe add a little more iris blur just to put a little more out of focus on the edges, and then go back into Painter, flip it, take a look at it, really take time to study it and look for more mistakes. And if I need to fix the eyes again for the hundredth time, I'll go back to the eyes. Make sure if you paint anything in sharp where it's already blurry, that you go ahead and blur it again to match the level of blurriness. You can do that with the blur blender or you can simply draw in sharp lines using something a bit softer like the airbrush. Anywhere where it's already sharp, it doesn't matter. You can keep it sharp there, but just keep that in mind. Now, some people would stop here and say, hey, that's good enough. It looks enough like who it's supposed to look like. This is a finished portrait. But again, this might only be 89% accurate, you know, and if I want to get it to 90%, I have to spend a little bit more time on it. And it's that last 10 or 20% that really takes the longest. Some people refer to this as the 80-20 rule. You can get 80% of the results with 20% of the work, but then the last remaining 20% takes 80% of the effort. And really, it's mostly the eyes that I'm not happy with. And I haven't been happy with the eyes since I started this painting because they're squinty old man eyes. And I haven't drawn a lot of squinty old man eyes, especially not ones that are looking from the side. So it's just something that I'm not familiar drawing. And I'm drawn to want to draw eyes as I imagine them, you know, in ways that I'm more comfortable drawing them. And that's not what I need to be doing here. And so painting realistically is really you fighting yourself to draw things as they actually are versus how you imagine them. And I'm zooming out rather small here because that's helping me make better judgments about how the piece is coming together. I can make a little change up close like this and then zoom back out to see how it looks. Up close, things can look like they make sense, but then when you look at it far away, it doesn't. So really use your judgment from far away more than up close. And I'm doing that here with the eyes. I know it's really hard to see the eyes when I zoom out, but it does, again, help me make better judgments about how it actually looks. So I think this is really starting to come together now. I will zoom in here and there and just look for anything that's too sloppy and I'll clean that up because, you know, if someone does zoom into this, I don't want them to see a really, really sloppy edge or a weird brush stroke that I didn't intend to be there. So like around the glasses, for instance, which I was a little looser with, I'm gonna go ahead and clean those up a bit and draw in a few more little details around the eyes. Because again, if somebody zooms in, they're probably gonna be drawn to the eyes first. So I don't need to have absolute 100% you 
realistic detail on stuff like the suit and things like that, because people probably won't zoom into that. And any little adjustments that I'm making, I'm always adding to new layers. That way I can reduce the opacity of them if I need to, or if I'm not happy with what I added, I'm not risking messing up anything that I am happy with. Now, as I start to add these final small details, I wanna stress the importance of having a nice, large, high resolution reference image, because if you're working with a very small image that doesn't have a very high resolution, you're not gonna be able to see all these little wrinkles and eyebrow hairs and details. And so you're gonna to have to either draw those through imagination or your portrait's gonna be limited to the resolution of your reference image. And so just make sure you get a nice, large reference image. And so now as I'm looking at the eyes, they're starting to look a little more realistic. They're matching the reference image better and they're looking less like how I imagine them and more like how they actually appear in the photo. And so I really just had to dedicate that much time to the eyes to getting them to look correct. It took a lot of observation and a lot of trial and error and a lot of painting and repainting just to get them perfect. Next, I'm gonna add a very subtle canvas texture on an overlay layer. So I'm gonna create a new layer, set it to overlay, and I'm going to apply a surface texture, which is a artist canvas surface texture. And I'll create a second overlay layer and I'll apply a thick handmade paper texture. That way I have two different layers of texture here. Next, I'll save a copy of my work. That way I can have a copy with and without the texture. I'll add a mask to that texture and then use the sponge to mask away some of it. That way it's not a consistent pattern. I'll reduce the opacity of it as well to help blend it in. And I'll repeat that process for the second texture as well. Now I have a very nice subtle texture. I'll go ahead and apply those layer masks and I'll merge those textures down into a single overlay layer. Now I'll just go through and kind of blend here and there, clean up the background. I want to avoid blending or painting on the texture layer. Just make sure that any painting you do is beneath that texture and keep that texture as the topmost layer. I notice over on the teeth, there's a few areas that kind of stand out as being too sharp and a little sloppy. So I'm gonna go through and just blend those with the diffuse blur just to soften them in help them blend in better. And at this point, I'm just zooming in, painting a little bit, zooming back out and looking at the piece. And if it's looking good zoomed out, typically you're on the right track. Now I'm gonna go ahead and just merge all my layers down into a single layer, and then I'll go ahead and select all and duplicate that layer into a duplicate layer. I'll blend a little bit using the coarse oily blender along with that thick handmade paper texture. That's just adding a little more texture to the skin. And then I can reduce the opacity of that layer if I want to get a more subtle blend. I'll create a new layer and add some more skin texture with the sponge. Then what I did there is I just moved the view of my canvas to one of my other monitors, just so I could gauge the contrast of that skin texture and make sure that it wasn't too dark. The other monitor that I have shows contrast a little bit differently than my Cintiq does. I'll draw in a few more little tiny details. Again, this is adding maybe 1% more realism to this painting, but every little bit counts. These are the finest of the fine details that I'm adding in here. You could call them the finishing touches. And really it's up to you to decide how far you wanna go with this piece. You could work on this forever, but at some point you have to call it finished. So I think I'm pretty close to making that judgment now. I'm gonna add a new layer with a sponge just to add some bigger vein textures to the nose there. I think that really helps the piece look more realistic. And I'm just looking at it up close because I see there's some areas where I had skin texture and I accidentally blurred over them and removed the skin texture. So I'm just putting that back in. I do want to soften the skin texture over on the softer side of the face where it's out of focus because otherwise it'll look like it's floating up above the canvas like dirt or something. Now at this point, I'm about five hours into this portrait painting and I don't think that there's much else that I can add to this to help it look that much better. Everything else I do is just going to kind of be a little nitpicky stuff. So with the last few strokes, I'm gonna take one last look at this and I'm gonna call this a completed portrait. So there you go, I hope you learned a lot about portrait painting. If you did, take a quick second to like this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.